today on Beyond Six Seconds. As leaders, sometimes we want other people who are exactly like us, who have the same style as we do. And when we do that, when we are trying to project onto other people our own qualities, we're not letting them shine their own qualities. Welcome to Beyond Six Seconds, the podcast that goes beyond the six second first impression to share the extraordinary stories and achievements of everyday people. I'm your host, Carolyn Keel. On today's episode, I'm speaking with Dr. Ginny Barrow. Ginny is the CEO and founder of Fearless Women at Work, an executive coaching and career strategy company. She's also a number one bestselling author of Fearless Women at Work, a motivational speaker, and a leadership expert. She specializes in helping organizations to develop leaders at all levels of management, as well as helping individuals who are navigating a corporate hierarchy, moving into an entirely new phase of their professional career, or experiencing a major life transition. Ginny, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Carolyn. It's great to be with you today. Wonderful. Great to have you here. So in the work you're doing now, you help leaders grow, find their strengths, tell their stories. But I understand you have a really interesting story yourself about how you've come to be where you are today. Uh, Would love if you could tell us a little bit about your own career journey and how it led you to start your own business. Sure, Carolyn. So my career began back in 91. I was uh, the first of an immigrant family from Dominican Republic to graduate from college. And I went to Rutgers to study computer science. Once I graduated, I began my corporate career with Prudential. And I stayed with them for almost eight years. And while I was with them, I went to school, graduate schools at night. And so I got my MBA. And then finally, when I got my MBA, I got the courage to apply for a a managerial role within Prudential. So I began my leadership career back in 1990, I want to say 1997, Mm -hmm. 1996. And it's been, I've never looked back. So from that particular role all the way to my next role with Alliance Capital, I just continue to take on more responsibility. I always had a passion for leadership. And I've always been like the little uh, mastermind, in my, you know, with my little friends, head of the of the pack kind mm-hmm. of thing. And so it's it's almost a, a a natural inclination towards finding better ways to do things, um, improving what is, looking at how people are feeling around me, the team, how they are showing up, how productive they're being, how unhappy or happy they are. And it's about change, about how do we help the teams, the people, the employees adapt to change and how do we create that workplace that is conducive to continuing to evolve because we know the corporate landscape is always evolving and how do we manage their needs in the process so that they can show up and be as productive as they possibly can. Yeah, absolutely. So that was that was kind of the the, the beginning of my whole leadership career. And then In 2016, after being in the corporate world for 26 years, what became very clear to me is that I needed to make some changes. Mm -hmm. And I had the choice to continue in a corporate track, which is where I had been for so many years, or to do something different. And I don't know about you, Carolyn, but most people that I speak with that have been working for decades get to a point where we want to change. And we also start to look at life differently. Mm -hmm. At least for me and the clients that I that I work with, we start to look at life from an impact perspective. What kind of impact am I having? And is this what I want to leave as my legacy? Mm-hmm. And so that's when I began the process of examining my skill sets, what I bring to the table, what I offer, what I'm passionate about, what I'm great at, my marketable skills, and reinvented my career to do what I'm doing now as an executive coach and career strategist which is leveraging all those years, 26 years of corporate experience and 20 years of leadership experience. So my biggest question was, how do I not throw away the baby with the bathwater mm-hmm. as I'm trying to reinvent myself? Sometimes I feel like I'm you know, a little bit of, of, of uh, Madonna, you know how she's mm-hmm. reinvented herself over and over again? Mm-hmm. Well, I've only done it twice or three times maybe, but it is about how do we transcend what we did into something new that we're passionate about so that we feel connected to that new purpose. Yeah. And that's how I ended up doing Fearless Women at Work. (laughs) Wow, that's awesome. 
I'd love to know a little bit about either the people or the programs that helped you along from the beginning, from your school days, college, and your um, your early days in your career, if you could share a little bit about that. Well, thank you, Carolyn. When you say a couple of people, that's such a, right? It's like, a, there's so many people involved in, in this entire process, all the way from, and I'll, I'll share this little tidbit with you and your audience. Back when I was in Dominican Republic and my mom immigrated to the U.S., you couldn't bring your children because you had to go. My, my grandmother was in the U.S. and she requested my mom. And so my mom received her visa and came to the U.S. Then she had to request me and my brothers and we had to wait for our visas. So while we were waiting there, I stayed with the landlord, the woman where my mom used to rent the second floor of this beautiful house. And the landlord always said to me, Ginny, in life, you're going to do whatever you set your mind to. And she was 82 years old. And when I graduated with my PhD, I dedicated my dissertation to Nuni because her voice always resonated in my head as she said, you can do whatever you set your mind to do. And so she really was one of those people who touched me, who didn't have to stay with me, who didn't have to tell my mother, go, I'll take care of her while you figure things out. She didn't have to do any of that. And she did. So Nuni to me is the image and the metaphor for paying it forward, for helping anyone that you possibly can help as long as they are willing to accept the help. And so Nuni was a huge person in my life who encouraged and believed in me. My mother obviously has been my biggest champion. My stepdad, whom I met when I came to the U.S. back in 1983, he pushed and pushed and pushed because he knew that I had the potential. And I appreciate him for that. He pushed me into going into the STEM field in computer science because I wanted to be in communications Mm -hmm. and I didn't know English. So Mm -hmm. he he tapped me on the shoulder and said, honey, you hardly know English. You can't do communications for your major in college. So I thank him for that because I've come full, full circle doing a lot of communication work now, but it's from a whole different place, right? So much, much stronger footing. So my stepdad was a big figure in my life. And then from there, a lot of the mentors and teachers that I've had over the years, including at work, my my managers, I know Steve Stravnicki was my first manager at Prudential. He was excellent. Unfortunately, he passed away um, not too long ago. He believed in me. He stretched me. He, I always went to him and asked him, what do I need to do next to get to my next level? And he always told me, honestly. And so I really appreciate him for providing such a, a great role model for me at the beginning of my career. And then from there, I've had mentors that were assigned to me through my work. I've had friends, Barbara White, who just pushed me to lead the Hispanic Heritage Month celebrations in Roseland, you know, when I was at Venture. I had people in my personal circles, friends, colleagues that have been with me for over 20 plus years of friendship from work. And my most recent mentors, my friend and my previous manager, uh, Richard O'Keefe, who was an honest man with an, an incredible work ethic, who taught me about doing what's best for the clients always, and also who showed me that caring for your employees and their development and their growth and doing a great job and hitting those numbers are not mutually exclusive. If anything, they're complementary. So Rich to me was, it still is a great friend and a mentor and other people in, you know, within the company, my, my, also my prior manager, Mike Rajimsky, who also believed in me, brought me on to be part of his senior leadership team at Lord Abbott, well, I st- uh, spent almost 17 years, always supported me. The head of the company, Daria Foster, always supported me. Uh, other senior members of, of the company um, and, uh, you know, Allison Haupt and just other peers and managers who saw something in me and gave me opportunities for me to run with the ball and also appreciated my differences, mm. which is one of the things that I believe we tend to fall into a trap. As leaders, sometimes we want other people who are exactly like us, who have the same style as we do. And when we do that, when we are trying to project onto other people our own qualities, we're not letting them shine their own qualities. 
So that's something that we need to be very cognizant of as leaders and to, instead of try to transform their style into ours, it's more about us stretching to accept and see what is valuable about the other style that is different from ours. Mm -hmm. And, And that is where the power comes, right? Because if you have different perspectives, different approaches, then you're able to come up with a better solution. Absolutely. And it's such an important point about mentorship because a lot of times leaders or or just people in general tend to gravitate towards other people that they feel are just like them. Oh, it reminds me of a younger version of me or, or I see so many qualities in you that were the same as me. But it's also really important to build those relationships and actively seek out talents and strengths that are different from your own because you really want that complete suite of skills and and talents in order to either move the business forward or achieve your goals or create new innovations in the marketplace. And sometimes it it means sort of fighting against a a human nature to look for people who are exactly like you, because sometimes it's just, it it sounds like your work is really, um, you've got to meet and, and work closely with a lot of people who really valued your different skills and perspectives. And I think that's wonderful. Yes. And, and, you know, I have to say that for, from, for the most part, most of my career, I have been extremely, from just talking with people, extremely lucky, I want to say, because for the most part, I've always enjoyed my work. I've always enjoyed the challenges. I've always pushed, pushed, pushed for my next level. And I always knew that that was incumbent upon me to do that, mm-hmm. that it wasn't my manager's job to promote me or to see what I brought to the table, but it was my job to know what I was doing, how I was doing it, how I was adding value and what I needed to do to get to the next level. Mm -hmm. And that was my responsibility. And if it wasn't mine, why, why should it be anybody else's? Right. And so I know that today, uh, you know, one of the biggest qualities or the desire competencies in a, in a leader is that they develop others. Mm -hmm. Of course. Right. There's a saying that I love, which is, What if we train them and they leave? Hmm. And then the flip side of that is, what if we don't train them and they stay? Exactly. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Who wants that, right? Right. So I know that uh, as leaders, that is part of our responsibility. But for those that are listening that are in the place of being a team member, I would say that it always behooves us as team members to be the ones looking for where are my gaps? How do I fill them? What are my strengths? How do I leverage them? And then based on that, how, how do I position myself for the role and for the responsibilities that I want to be involved in? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And a common piece of advice to people when they're starting out in their jobs or they're trying to make a change is to go find a mentor. And I think that I think a lot of times people have no idea what that means or what that is. I remember uh, reading uh, Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In and she has a whole chapter on like, will you be my mentor sort of thing? Yes, Um, don't ask. Please don't ask. Exactly. So I'm curious, how do you, you know, I mean, sometimes mentors are assigned to you, but often they're not. So how do you define mentorship? So yeah, my first mentor was assigned to me at Prudential Mm -hmm. and that was, that was not an organic mentorship. It kind of just, here's Nancy, here's Ginny. And it was great because she showed me the role she kind of let, you know helped me understand the company, the structure, and things of that nature. And then when when the assignment was over, then we were just friends, but we did not continue the mentorship. Subsequent to that, I've had mentors throughout my entire career, and I, I write about mentors in my blog at fearlesswomenatwork.com. I write about mentors and sponsors in my book, Fearless Women at Work, because no matter how smart and how astute you are as a professional, you cannot advance your career alone. And what I mean by that is you have to have a support structure of people who believe in you, people who are going to give you stretch assignments, people who are going to say, hey, we're running this initiative and we need someone in technology. We need someone in the business. We need someone in this space Mm -hmm. to be the lead on this. Who could that be? And you want someone in that room to believe in you enough to say, I think Ginny would be great for that. I think Carolyn will be great for that. If you don't have somebody who knows you, who knows your strengths, who knows what you bring to the table, with whom you have a relationship that isn't just a transaction, but an actual professional relationship, you know them, they know you, um, you kind of know each other's personalities, you joke around, you're serious, you talk about business, you talk about the weekend, then it's really difficult for someone to make an assessment as to whether or not you will be good in that stretch assignment. 
So what I would suggest to somebody starting out, and I talk about this in my book, is just go into your role, see who are the people that you're interacting with, and get extremely curious. Get curious about your business. Get curious about the different functions within the organization. Look at how your role fits within the big picture and begin to just ask to speak and have conversations with other people in other departments who you want to learn from. For example, if Carolyn, if you're in the legal group and as in my new role, I'm responsible for vendor management. And part of that process includes doing legal the contracts, right? Whether the statement of works or the actual contracts. Then I want to understand what is the legal process to get a contract reviewed and approved. Mm-hmm. So that's a great opportunity for you as, as somebody who's not in the legal department to say to, let's say, Larry or to John, who's in the, uh, in, in the legal department, or, or Brooke, and say to them, Brooke, I would love to have lunch with you and understand what is the process for approving this, these contracts that I'm going to be working with. I can guarantee you that if you work with Brooke and her schedule, you'll be able to set up a lunch with Brooke Mm -hmm. or even coffee with Brooke to understand that. Because one, she's going to be contributing. She's going to be sharing what she does, which people love to talk about what they do. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't know anyone who would say, there are some people, don't get me wrong. But I think for the most part, I think people are pretty open to sharing what they do and how they do it and how, you know, how things work. Mm -hmm. especially when you're younger and when you're new and they know that you need that information. Mm -hmm. So that's how I would say approach mentorships. As you approach people, you're going to find whether or not you have chemistry together. It's like dating, right? When you're dating somebody, you meet them. And if you have chemistry, great. You kind of continue to talk and and, and meet and et cetera. Same thing with, with somebody like that. The mentor relationship develops organically. In that proactively, once in a while, I would reach out to these people that I've had conversations with who seem to be nice about sharing information. And I would just say, hey, Bob, I think we're due for coffee or we're due for lunch. Let's catch up. And I'm talking about a senior member of my company, not somebody that was my peer, not somebody who was reporting to me. This is one of the senior partners of my previous company. And we used to have regular lunches. But that was coming from me. And sometimes he would run into me and say, hey, Gene, I think we do for lunch. Mm. So that's how we develop mentorships and those types of relationships. And what's really important, Carolyn, too, I want to point out, is that it's not a one-way street. Mm -hmm. So whenever you're meeting with your mentor, make sure that you're also going to give them information, that you're going to contribute something of value to them. If you're meeting with a more senior person, they don't have your perspective. They don't know what it's like to be, quote unquote, in the trenches. So share some of that perspective with them. You know, I'm feeling like people are feeling a little unsettled around the news that was released, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, really? What are they saying? Just share what you are experiencing because that gives them value. Mm -hmm. That gives them a perspective that they don't currently have. And so that's on the mentor side. The sponsors, the way that I distinguish the two is that a mentor is somebody that you build a relationship with that you can talk about all kinds of topics. The sponsors are people that are more senior, who usually have a say or influence within the company to give you stretch assignments, to put your name in a hat, just like a sponsor, uh, a a mentor would, but at a higher level. Um, Somebody who would actually say, no, I want Ginny to do that project. I want Ginny to be the one, be the project manager for that project. That kind of, you know, uh, leverage. And they are the kind of people that you want to share good news with. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You want to talk about how the role is going, how the project is going. If you run into a snag, how you guys overcame that snag, et cetera. And those are, those are the people that are, that are also extremely impactful and, and can be very influential in your career. And the same thing goes for those people. Connect with them on a business level, but then connect with them on a human level too. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great distinction to make between mentors and sponsors and so important to have both in your career. So you've had a really successful long corporate career, but recently decided to go out on your own with your own business. What was it about this point in time or this point in your career that led you to make that decision? Well, thank you, Carolyn. So I was in my late 40s. I, um, I just turned 49 and I was uh, 47, I want to say, 47, 48, when I decided to go out on my own. And 
it was a really scary transition period because when you've only been working full time for an, a corporation for your entire career, the thought of going out on your own could be pretty daunting. Mm-hmm. And so I had to, to really dig in to, to figure out why would I want to do this? Why, why is this the right path for me? In my particular case, my, in my personal life, and this is part of what I've learned to do since really connecting with what is my unique value proposition, which is being honest and genuine about who I am and what I do. Um, back in uh, 2010, I began a pretty brutal divorce. Mm-hmm. And as a result, six, you know, four years later, everything was resolved, but I ended up having to live in a particular area in New Jersey mm-hmm. because I would never give up custody of my son, of course. So to be able to share custody with my ex-husband, I had to stay in the same town where we were married. Mm-hmm even though my work was 65 miles away each way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, quite the commute, quite the the strain on life. And so my choice at that point was, do I leave my son, which is not going to happen, or do I reinvent my career so that I can be more local to where I'm going to be living full time? And so that was a big driver for me. That was one. The second one was, I could still get a corporate job nearby, right? making a 10th or a 20th of what I used to make because I live in a very rural area where there isn't a lot of financial services, technology types of businesses. So this is not my market. That's the main problem. And so I I thought to myself, what can I do with my passion, my passion for leadership, my passion for inclusive workplaces? How can I leverage all this knowledge and, and strategies and training that I have and experience how can I leverage that and help people along the way, which is one of the things that a lot of the people that I help and a lot of my friends, they're into, you know, doing some good in the world. Mm-hmm. So how can I leverage all of that and at the same time be able to make a living from it? Mm-hmm. And so that's when I connected with what is my unique value proposition? What am I great at? What are my qualities? What is my why? And what are my marketable skills? And when I did that, which is what I help my, my clients do. When I connected with that, I said, wow, you know, executive coaching, career strategy, motivational speaking, this is what I love to do. And so connecting with people, strategizing, having both a strategic and tactical perspective, that's what I love. I, I love solving problems. I love breaking things down from the big picture to actionable steps. That's what I did for so many years in the corporate world as a project manager. And so liaising between business and technology, that was the genesis of me starting my own business. And then finally, to get over the fear, to get over the the hurdle of, oh my gosh, I'm going to be on my own. How do I do that? I'm the the sole breadwinner for my family. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm single head of household. I had to just sit down and say, really, what does my financial picture look like? And this is a really important point that I want to share with your audience, which is, you know, when we live day by day, it's very difficult for us to to have choices because we are living day by day. But when we begin, even at the start of our career, I remember when I first graduated college, I began my 401k. So I've been putting away money in my 401k since day one. I happened to work for a financial firm, which was helpful because it was emphasized, but Very early on, I learned about the power of compounded interest and time. And so I've been saving, I've been living under my means for years. And so I I have multiple properties that I purchased over the years and that I've been able to hold on to as I moved to different places. So from a financial perspective, I looked at my financial picture and I said, what does this look like? How much do I really need to live until my business picks up? And I concluded that I had some leeway to give this a shot. And if things didn't work out financially, that I always reserve the option to go back Mm -hmm. to a corporate job. But I have to share this, Carolyn. Once you connect to what is uniquely your unique value proposition, and when you know what you bring to the table and what you offer, and and you know you're adding value to your clients, to your customers, to your partners, there is absolutely no way that you can fail. Powerful, powerful statement. 
And I'm so fascinated to hear about all the different things that you took into account, the financial and, and your strengths and what your value proposition was and geographically where you're living, your holistic life. I would imagine a lot of people, when they're thinking about making a change like that, they don't even know what they're good at, or they may not even know what they like to do. So what was your process for figuring that out for yourself? So the process for me, and this is where the book came, right? So what I use was, <laughs> I went inward. You know, I went inward to figure out who am I? What's important to me? What matters to me? What's my why? Why do I get up every morning? And then I said, okay, so what am I good at? What am I great at? What can I do with my eyes closed? Because I can do it so well. In other words, what are my natural abilities? Things that I can do that take no effort. They're, they're just innate, right? Mm -hmm. And then I talked about what are my marketable skills? What can I get paid to do? What have I gotten paid to do in the past? Mm -hmm. What do I know so well that I can teach someone else? And this is part of where my business came from. Well, what do I know so well is I know how to see something that is a problem and strategize about solutions, but also keep, you know, keep in mind that everybody's different and that everybody's in a different situation. So you can't just throw a blanket over everything. Right. So I went inward to figure all of that out for myself. And as a result of that, 10 years of doing that, Carolyn, is where I came up with my five-step system called CARES, spelled C-A-R-E-S. And those are the five strategies that I share in my book, Fearless Women at Work, Five Powerful Strategies to Thrive in Your Career and Life. And so just to give you a quick overview, CONNECT, CARES stands for CONNECT to your truth and your purpose. And that includes what's important to you, what matters to you, what you're great at, what you can get paid to do, what gives you strength. Where do you pull your source of strength? That's all connecting to, to you, to, to this wonderful person who you are. And if you can imagine, everybody would have a very unique combination of things that they're great at, their qualities, and marketable skills. Nobody could possibly do the same thing in the same way that you do it, mm -hmm. even if you both have the same role. So it is a world of abundance, not a world of a scarcity when you look at it from that perspective. Mm -hmm. And then what happens when you do that is you boost your confidence because then you truly know this is how I add value. This is what, what lights me up. This is what brings me joy. And this is what I get paid to do. And so after I did the connecting, aligning is really important. How do you align where you are and where you want to be? There's usually a gap. And then how do you create that bridge to get from point A to point B in a way that supports you financially, emotionally, and spiritually? And that's what I did for myself. And then rising. Rising is rising above your real and fictitious challenges. A lot of the clients I talk to, uh, Carolyn, talk about self, self doubt, low confidence, being nervous about speaking up, especially in a room where there's a lot of different people of different ranks. And so, in many ways, we hold ourselves back. And I just had a conversation yesterday with one of my clients about that. And I said, if our ultimate goal is to add value to the people in the room, to the company, to the organization, when we hold back, we need to shift our mindset from, I wonder how they're going to judge me. I wonder if they're going to say, I have nothing valuable to say. I wonder, 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 wonder. It's all fiction. We're making up all these stories about what people may, how they may perceive us, how they may judge us, et cetera. And so we hold back. But in doing so, what are we not doing? When we hold back, we're not adding value. So that's one way that I would say, shift how you are looking at yourself and forget about you and think about the others and what they're going to miss because you're not speaking up, because you're not sharing your knowledge and your insights, mm -hmm. which I'm sure if you're going to say something, unless you're one of those people who think and speak at the same time, unless you're one of those people, I would say that you probably are going to give whatever you're going to say some thought so think about how you're contributing and how you're adding value. And it, from that platform, it's very hard to hold back. Mm -hmm. So that's the uh, rise, right? Rise mm -hmm. above your real and fictitious challenges. Yep. The, the real challenges are skills. You may need to learn something. You may need to fill a gap that you have. You may need to get public speaking training. You may need to learn how to write better. Those are all real, real challenges. Mm -hmm. The next one is envision the future. So that's where I went to look at what is my future? What does that look like? What can I create? I now work from home. I travel to my clients whenever it's convenient around my son's schedule and my parenting schedule. I do motivational speaking engagements. I am doing trainings for corporations uh, that are being distributed to over 7,000 of their members. I am 
putting together customized programs for companies based on their specific needs and challenges. And so I am doing all the stuff that I've always loved to do, planning, putting things together from beginning to end, taking a problem, breaking it down into pieces, using my communication skills, using my passion for leadership development, my passion for creating inclusive workplaces, my passion for women's empowerment in terms of them also being part of that senior leadership pipeline Mm -hmm. and having a a role in, in helping them stay there and move up the pipeline. And so that's, that was the future that I envisioned. And that's the future that I'm creating because my actions will be driven by my vision. And if I don't have a vision of what I want to create, then what am I going to do yeah. to create it if I have no clue? So one needs to precede the other. You need to have a vision and then your actions will follow. And then last, seek support and serve others. Seek support of mentors, teachers, resources, institutions, people, places, experiences that can help propel you to get you from where you are to where you want to be. And in the process, as you're doing all that, mentor others, sponsor others, help others, you know, provide your strategies and experiences to others so that they can also get to where you are. No matter how far you want to get, there is always someone who's trying to get to where you are. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So throw them a rope, bring them along. And that's part of the five strategies. So that's what I used, Carolyn, to get from where I was to where I am today. And that's what I help my clients do today, too. That's fantastic. It really just looks across the entire scope of everything that you need to really think through and and make that change into action. That's awesome. So tell me more about your business and what you're doing now with coaching. So what I'm doing right now is uh, primarily I'm, I'm working with organizations and individuals and my my ultimate agenda and goal is always to develop leaders at all levels of management. So whether, as you mentioned in my introduction, whether you're navigating a corporate hierarchy, you're looking to uh, get promoted, you're looking to maybe even find what is it that I really want to do and how do I want to serve in this world, that's what I help you do. If you are looking to change careers, I help you figure out how can you translate your skill sets into something that you're passionate about that is also able to give you uh, the ability to make a living because we do have to make a living for the most part. And so it's important to create, like I said, that bridge that will support you financially and emotionally and spiritually. And so I am not religious in any way, but I am spiritual. I do believe that there's a creator and a bigger force than me that has been helping and driving and that to me is guiding me to take the next right step. So everybody has their own spiritual guidance, let's call it that. Mm -hmm. And so you need to tap into that, whatever that may be for you, because that is going to be a source for us whenever we're down, whenever we things look bleak, whenever things don't go our way, we're going to get on our knees and be like, oh my gosh, I just fell. Mm -hmm. How are we going to get up? It could be faith. It could be gratitude. It could be whatever you call it. So it's important for me to support my clients, organizations who are, look, organizations are are struggling, right? Mm -hmm. They're struggling to be profitable, to compete in a global marketplace, to keep up with changes and, and the fast pace of technology. They're struggling with a new generation of workers. They're struggling in so many different ways. And each and every one of us at different tranches of, of the ladder have an ability to contribute to When we look at the problem from it's our problem, not theirs versus mine, we all have a different perspective that can contribute to to that solution. All the way from the 40 pluses and the 50 pluses and the 60 pluses employees to the millennials, to the people that are starting to join these corporations. And as a manager and a leader who's either an emerging leader starting a career or a seasoned leader, I believe that having that open mind knowing that everybody has something valuable to contribute and that different doesn't mean bad and that I need to open my mind so that I can understand somebody else's perspective and then be compassionate about differences and leverage the differences versus, you know, wanting to be back in the past because that's just, it's history. It's, you're never going to get the past, but rather let's look at what we have in front of us and how do I help every single person that I run into shine. The only way that I can do that is by understanding them, connecting with them, and really getting to know what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses. Let me leverage their strengths. Let me develop their weaknesses. And where can I best put that person? Because if they're not shining, if they're they're not a rock star, that means they're in the wrong role. Yeah. 
Now that may mean that they're not in the right role in your corporation too. So sometimes we have to make those tough decisions and, and, and realize that this person doesn't belong here. And that's compassionate too, because then you're giving them a chance to go find their home instead of keeping somebody around who's not performing, who's, who's miserable. And then you're miserable too, because they're not doing what they're supposed to do. So it's important to be self-aware of what's happening around you, what's happening with you, and to also manage how you're showing up. You know, we don't realize that so much of what people do when they are with us is react to us. Yep. So if you are noticing that people are not acting or behaving in the way that you would want, begin by questioning, how am I showing up? And do I have anything to do with that? Am I not letting them speak? Am I not seeing them? Am I not uh, giving them significance? Everybody wants to feel important. Am I not recognizing that? And then once you do that self-assessment and you realize, no, I am letting them speak. No, I am recognizing them. Then that's a whole different conversation, mm -hmm. right? Now we focus on the person and say, okay, what's going on with you, Carolyn? I noticed that you show up and you're not enthused about work. And, and you know, is, is there something that you want to share with me? And then that's how you open the dialogue. I may not even know what's happening with you. I may not even know that you're having some serious problems at home. You, you know, somebody's ill, you may be ill, who knows? And so it's not about pride. It's about being human and connecting and noticing and having the courage to say what you notice in a professional way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's important to be tuned in to yourself and, and how you're feeling and showing up, as you said, and others around you as well. So looking forward, what are your goals for your business as you kind of look into the future for it? Wow, that's a big question. So as you know, I've only started my business in the last couple of years. So I'm at, I'm at the infancy stage. I'm still crawling. My goal is to build an organization where we have a deep bench of qualified coaches and uh, motivational speakers and trainers who have the ability to go into a client site, to speak to a client, an organization and be able to understand what are their main pain points and create solutions that are truly going to make a difference in the different areas of leadership development, diversity and inclusion, and creating engaged workforces. Those are big, big topics for me. And if, if I can make a dent in that area and also help women garner that equality that we have been fighting for for so many years and that if things don't change will take a hundred years to happen if I can move the needle in any of those areas I would be a happy camper so the big picture includes the motivational speaking it includes the training and facilitating leadership retreats and workshops because I want to also enjoy my life and those are the things that I enjoy I, I love travel so to me, to be able to combine my passion for leadership development with a retreat, which I'm actually having one coming up now on November 9th, 10th, and 11th, I'm having a fearless leadership retreat mm -hmm. up here in the Kittitini Mountains in New Jersey, Vernon, New Jersey. I want to be able to integrate my life so that my work and my passions and what brings me joy don't necessarily have to be mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. So putting together those powerful, in immersive, intense but yet invigorating types of events that that help people fill up at the same time as they're learning that's like a perfect scenario that's awesome yeah to bring it all together that sounds great so how can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about you and and your business and uh all the things that you're working on sure so the best way to reach me is through my website uh, fearlesswomenatwork.com and anybody who's interested in exploring what it would be like to work with me, there is a get started link where they can set up a complimentary strategy session. I get to choose my clients and they get to choose me. We only work together if I know that I'm going to add value to them. And if they know that I'm going to add value to them. So I always have that first conversation so that I can understand what's going on. What are the problems? What are the challenges? What are you trying to accomplish? What kind of results are you looking for? And only if I can truly help. And I know in my, in my heart of hearts, and I know from experience that I've been able to help other people in similar situations, then I will say, yes, here's what we would do. Here's how we would do it, et cetera. So that is, that is what we're here. I mean, to me, Carolyn, my why is this is a really short life we live. I mean, we're only here for a speck of time when you look at the whole timeline, right? right. Speck of time. So 
why why am I here? Why am I why am I breathing? You know, what is my purpose? And so to me, this is my purpose right now to help to develop leaders and to help people rise to their leadership potential. I know that sounds a little cliche, but that is true. If I'm able to see you, Carolyn, and see you and say, Carolyn, from speaking with you, from coaching with you, I see how much potential you have. What's holding you back? We break through that. And then you're like, oh my gosh, I care what people say about me. I don't want to fail. I don't, you know, all of these things that come up. And then we're able to break through and then you're able to be free because ultimately one of my values is freedom. I, you know, I want to feel that I have choices, possibilities, and that I can come and go and do what I want to do and contribute how I want to contribute versus feeling like I'm confined and constricted and, you know, shackled and all of these things that people say that they feel when they're working, doing something that they don't like. Mm. We work most of the day. That's what we do. We're working at least eight, at least eight hours a day. Most of us work 10 plus hours a day. So if we are doing that, why not do something that we're crazy about? Absolutely. We spend so much time, as you said, it's uh, important for us to feel that connection and feel that passion. Thank you so much, Jenny, for being a guest on my podcast. I really enjoyed learning and hearing all your advice on, on mentorship and leadership and, and hearing more about your story and how you came to be where you are today, helping the next generation of leaders. So thank you for sharing your story today. Well, Carolyn, I love what you're doing. And um, I know when we first spoke, you told me why you do your why as to why you do this. And it's because you want to hear from everybody's perspective. And so I appreciate what you're doing in this podcast. And I thank you for having me as we guest today. Thanks for listening to Beyond Six Seconds. Please help us spread the word about this podcast. Share it with a friend. Give us a shout out on your social media or write a review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player. You can find all of our episodes on our website, www.beyond6seconds.com. Until next time.